محمد وعلى محمد صلوات الله الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدي وحبيبي ونور قلبي وثمرة فؤادي أبو القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المقسومين الهاديين الذين ذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد قال الله العلي العظيم في كتاب الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون واعتصموا بحبل الله جميعا ولا تفرقوا واذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ كنتم أعداء فألف بين قلوبكم فأصبحتم بنعمته إخوانا وكنتم على شفا حفرة من النار فأنقذكم منها كذلك يبين الله لكم آياته لعلكم تهتدون صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد Tonight our topic is about Islam and peace Is Islam a religion of peace or a religion of violence And we all know how important this topic can be and especially when you go to a new on a website online unfortunately there are a lot of websites that are propagating against Islam I was checking some of the information about Islam from the non-Muslims from those enemies of Islam one of the views that they say and I don't want to mention the name of the website because I don't want to make that website popular <laughs> What the, what the website is saying is Islam is a religion of violence and they said, I'm quoting them, they said when you look at the violence that happened by the Muslims right, <clears throat> throughout the 10 years they call it 10 years, how many of you think it is? according to their accounting, they said 18,000 violence just in 10 years and all by Muslims and all of this okay all of this they put it one side and they look at all the religions Buddhism Judaism Christianity they look their violence all of them in combined they didn't even make half of it but Islam made more than that it doesn't stop there when you go to the website they even keep track of every violence that takes place in the Muslim world. They put the date, the time, the place, the number of people got killed, and the cause of that violence. It's the, every single, the was that you don't even hear. You go there, there is a Syria, there is Iran, there is Iraq, there is Lebanon, the, every corner of Muslim world. But that all information. And they try to tell the world that this is what Islam is about. If you want Islam, that is Islam. It's a religion of violence. No peace, nothing about Islam that is good. So be careful of being a Muslim. That is the message. So is this a real what Islam is about? Or it is misconception about Islam? Tonight, I just want to mention what Islam is about one two 
what are the causes of violence that you see? Two, three, what are the solutions? These are the three steps. That what is the Islam is about? Is Islam a peaceful religion or a violence religion? Two, what are the causes of these violence that we see? And three, what are the solutions? Number one, the ayah that I just read is from Surah Ali Imran, ayah 103, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk about Islam and peace. How Islam can be a religion of peace. Now, just before we go to the ayah, when you look at the reason why this ayah was revealed, why this ayah was revealed in Surah Ali Imran, verse 103, before Islam, before the Prophet came, before he started his mission, the entire Arabs, the entire Arab Peninsula, what they used to do is, they used to live a life of jungle. And at that moment, they used to have two, two tribes, which today we can call them the superpowers of that time. One of them is called al aus the other one is called al khazraj These were the dominant tribes. These tribes, they used to fight each other for years, killing one, other, one another, till the point generation has lost life, properties, you name it, they lost it throughout the years. And this continued for so many years. Until who came? The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Then they both tried, accepted Islam. They both became Muslim. After they became Muslim, they became Muslim. Years later, there is one man from the house, and his name is Tha'laba ibn Ghunam. Tha'laba ibn Ghunam, that is his name. One day, as they were sitting, as the companion of the Prophet, he started to mention his ancestors. And he said, look, we, as a family, or as a tribe of Aus, one of our ancestors is a man called the Shahadatain. And you know the Shahadatain is one of the companions of the Prophet, who the Prophet gave him a title. And the title is, there is one witness is the equivalent of two. You know what happened? Why, why did he get this title? One day the Prophet was walking. A man came and he grabbed the Prophet. Ya Rasulullah, you owe me. The Prophet said, yes, I know, I owe you, I paid you. It's over, I paid you. I said, no, you didn't pay me. He was arguing with the Prophet back and forth, back and forth. This companion passed by. Ya Rasulullah, what's the matter? Why is he holding you? The Prophet he said, I owe him and I paid him, but he doesn't agree that I pay him and I don't have any evidence to prove it. Then the man said, Ya Rasulullah, I believe you paid him. Allah You believe I paid him? He said, yes. Did you see? He said, no. Were you there? He said, no. He said, how come were you saying that I paid him? He said, Ya Rasulullah, you tell us about the heaven that we are not there and we believe you and you're telling me you paid him and I don't believe you? MashaAllah. I believe you, Rasulullah. Then Allah Prophet says, your witness is equivalent of two. And from that day, they started to call him the Shahadatain. Now this man was from the tribe of Aus. So this Ta'ala ibn Ghulam, he stood up and he said, among us, the pride of ours is this man who earned this higher position in front of Allah and the Prophet. And then he goes in the line of their ancestors and, 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 and. Another man also from other tribe, and his name is As'ad ibn Zurara. That's another companion from al Khazraj. He also stood up. He said, what are you talking about? If you're talking about your ancestors, we have to. And he started going through the list. He's Ancestors, what did they do in Islam, and so on and so forth. Immediately, then they stood in front of each other. Ta'ala ibn Ghunam, and then also As'ad ibn Zurara. As they stood in front of each other, then the tribe of Aus, they came behind al Aus, the man Ta'ala, they ready to fight. Then the other tribe of Khazrat also they came, they stood behind him. They said, you attack him, we attack you. 
The Prophet was at home at that moment. One of them ran and went to the Prophet. Ya Rasulullah! A fight is started between the two tribes. The Prophet came and he said to them, Ya Ayyuhan Nas, oh you people, remember what you used to be? You accepted Islam, you won. Why are you fighting? Why is, why is violence among the two of you? While the Prophet was speaking to them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet a text message. <laughs> no text message, right? Ah, text message. What's that text message? Ah, Jabra'il come. Ya Rasulullah, listen. What is it? Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu taqullah. The Prophet called, and Allah called them, al ladheena amanu. Those who believe, taqullah. Fear Allah. Then he says, haqqa tuqati. True fear. The sincere one. The true fear in your heart. Because there are two kinds of fear. Sometimes I say, I fear Allah. But where? In my mouth. It doesn't get to the heart. No, Allah says, The true fear that comes from the heart. And then He says, Wala Don't die. Illa wa antum muslimun. Do not allow yourself to die unless you are true Muslim. And here is another point, brothers and sisters, before I go to the point. Here, this part is very important. Why is it important? Because the beginning is good, but it's not as important as the end. Our beginning as a Muslims is good. But what is more important is the end. How am I going to die? Am I going to die being a believer or am I going to change and become something else? That's what Quran said. Wala tamutunna. Allah even put an emphasis, which is called Nuna Tawqid. Do not die unless you are a true Muslim. Then after that, Allah say, وَاَتَسِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ Join together, collectively, on the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here there is a lot of tafsir. What is the meaning of حَبْلُ Allah? The rope of Allah. Here some say, it's Allah. Some say, Al-Quran. Some say, the Prophet. Some say, Ahl al-Bayt. Some say, all of them are considered حَبْلُ Allah. We have to all collectively, Join and hold the rope of Allah. And then Allah says, Wala tafarraku. Do not disperse. Do not cause any division among yourself. Then Allah remind them. Wathkuru ni'mat Allah. Remember the blessing of Allah upon you. If kuntum a'da'at. When you were enemies to each other. When you used to fight each other. As an house in Khazraj. Wa kuntum a'da'at. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made you to become brothers, love each other. And with His blessings and mercy, you became brothers. You became brothers when you were enemies. Allahu Akbar. Now the reason why I brought this is to tell that Islam is a religion that brings people together. Not a religion that calls people to separate. Or divide among themselves. Islam is a religion that brings the people collectively. Now, when you look in the life of the Prophet, before Islam, before Islam, and the history proves this, that when the Prophet ﷺ, before he started his mission and Kaaba was destroyed, what happened? The non Muslims, they built the Kaaba and they got to the point of putting the Ajar al Aswad, the black stone, back to the position. Every tribe wants to take the privilege. No tribe wants another tribe to take that privilege. And it turns to a fight between themselves. What happened? The Prophet ﷺ, he was in there. But then among themselves, they said anybody who walks in, anybody who comes in, is going to be the one to solve, to solve our problem. If you agree among yourself, they say we agree. The Prophet ﷺ, he walks in. They say, Alhamdulillah. What a better person to solve our differences. The Prophet came and they told him the story. The Prophet told them. They said, okay, how many are you? How many tribes are you? They say, we are four tribes. The Prophet took his Abba. He put on the floor. He took the Hajar and Aswad. Put on the Abba. And he asked every tribe to come and hold one of the corner of that tribe. So that they all get the privilege they're looking for. Until they took that. Next to the Hajar al Aswad and next to the uh, place where Hajar al Aswad is, the Prophet picked it and put it back. Do you call that man a man of violence? 
a man who came and solved the dispute among the people who are willing to start fighting the prophet solved the problem among themselves that is one number two to look at the islam that the prophet وسلم, when he came the prophet and by the way you know in islam we don't have any war no any history that ever recorded that the prophet ever started attacking somebody just because they are not believers there is no such war our scholars they said in islam there is one war which is called al harbul hujumi there is one war it's called harbul hujumi and then the second one is called al harbul difai one is to attack the other one is to defend right in Islam, they said, we only have one war that you are allowed to attack. One. And this is not even all the scholars. Some of the scholars, one of them is Ayatollah Makarim Shirazi in his tafsir. He said, there is one war that Islam allow you to attack. And when is it? And he says, it's the only time when people become mushrik. Mushrik, because... A shirk is not considered, uh, no, no, not mushrik, when they become what they call like worshipping idols. Because in Islam, idol worshipping is not considered religion. As a matter of fact, it's playing with the mind of human being. Any religion, one wants to become Christian, they want to become Jew. Any religion is respected in Islam. Except worshipping idols, Islam doesn't see that as a religion. That's why they said, he said, as Islam allows the people to first try to talk to them, try to bring them back to Islam. If they don't, then he said at that point, the Islam gives the green light for some people to do something like bringing them to Islam. But other than that, every war in Islam that our prophet went through, they are called harbu difai. All of them were self-defense. Now you go back to the history of our Prophet. What happened to the Prophet when he was in Mecca? The Prophet was attacked. He was forced to leave Mecca against his own will. The Prophet left and never fought anybody. Two, his companions were told to leave Mecca. And when they were leaving Mecca, they were told not to take anything. The rich people among them, they have to leave their houses, they have to leave their money, their everything. And they came to Medina empty-handed. And they didn't fight anybody. The Prophet told them, no, let, leave everything and you come back to me. And that's what happened. The Prophet never fought anybody. That's number two. Number three, our Prophet was, even after he went to Medina, the Prophet never attacked. The Prophet was strong financially, physically, but never attacked anybody. The first war that happened in Islam, which is the Battle of Badr. Now when you read the history, People have to understand the history of the Prophet. Every war that he went through, was it a self-defense or he was the one attacking? Now just to give us an, an idea, first battle in Islam happened in the, in the month of Ramadan. In Ramadan, when somebody is fasting, would you go and fight with somebody? When you're dealing with yourself, you're thinking about your hunger and thirst. That was the situation of Muslims. The Prophet and his companion were fasting and they were not thinking about fighting anybody. The fight was brought to them. How did that happen? The narration stated, when the Prophet was in Medina, in the month of Ramadan, Abu Sufyan was coming with the caravan from Syria. As they were coming, the Prophet had the caravan is coming, but he didn't, they didn't know whether the caravan is coming to attack or is passing by. The Prophet sent two people just to go and watch. Are they coming to fight? Or are they just passing by? They went and they saw the caravan. They were passing by. They came from Syria, Sham. They were passing by. They went back and told the Prophet, this were a caravan that is passing by. That's it. Abu Sufyan, when he saw these two people, he thought they came to fight. They are not carrying guns. They are not carrying anything. Then immediately he sent the news to the people of Mecca that I am about to be attacked and I need your help. That's when they came to Mecca. They come to Medina, prepared to fight the Holy Prophet. The Prophet وسلم, was in Medina when he heard the people of Mecca came. They were prepared to attack and fight you, Ya Rasulullah. The Prophet وسلم, said, what should we do in this case? Should we defend ourselves or just let them? 
Here another ayah came where Allah told him in the Quran, Allah said, now I give you permission. To do what? To defend yourself, Ya Rasulullah. That is what happened in the first battle in Islam. That the Prophet have to defend himself because of the attack that came. So the Prophet defended himself in that battle. What the Prophet ended up being victorious in that battle. And that was the first battle in Islam. The Prophet didn't attack anybody. That is one. Number two, the second battle which took place also, which is the battle of Uhud. Also happened why? Because the non-believers, because they were defeated in the first battle, they couldn't take it. Because when they came, they were strong. Their number was more than the number of the Prophet and his companion. And they couldn't understand how did that happen? That with their large number, with their facilities, with their power, the Prophet defeated them. How did that happen? And there were some of them, like Hind, right? She wanted revenge because she lost her father and lost her some of the family member. So she wanted the revenge. She said, I could not go to rest until the killer of my, fa my father is brought to justice. Also got killed. That's what he said. And she was behind all this fight that she caused the battle of Uhud to take place. And what happened? Also the same thing. They attacked the Prophet and his companions. And the Prophet wasallam was in self-defense. Every war that happened in Islam was all about self-defense. No war that the Prophet attacked other people just because they are not Prophet. They are not Muslims. No. As a matter of fact, in Islam, it's haram to force somebody to become a Muslim. You cannot do that. Somebody has to become a Muslim by will because in the Quran, Allah said in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah said, La ikraha fi deen. And the reason why this ayah was revealed, a man came to the Prophet. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I have two sons. And those two sons, they were Christians. As I was Christian too, before I became a Muslim. And I became a Muslim, and they were Christians. They're still Christians, but one thing bothered me, Ya Rasulullah. Some missionaries came from Sham, and they joined them, and now they became missionaries. Ya Rasulullah, I want your permission. To do what? To force them to bring them in Islam. Allahu Akbar. Before he asked, the Prophet said anything, Allah said, Ya Rasulullah, tell him. La ikraha fi deen. There is no compulsory in religion. Why? Because religion is something has to do with the heart. You can force somebody to say shahadatain, but if it doesn't come into the heart, from the heart, it's useless and baseless. And that's why Islam doesn't allow anybody to be against Islam and to be forced to become a Muslim or be in religion. No. There is no one single incident where the Prophet forced somebody to become a Muslim. Everybody who became Muslim, they came willingly. That is in terms of the war. Now, in terms of the Prophet, as they say, they say Islam cannot live with the other religion. Now, when you go to the back to the religion, to the back to the time of the Prophet, didn't the Prophet live with the Christians? After the Prophet, some of the Imams, they used to work in the farms of non-believers. Some of them were Jews. In Mecca and Medina, they own farms and the Imams go into that farm to work for them and end their halal income. And they didn't force them to become Muslim and they didn't fight them just because they are not Muslims. Not only that, Ayatul Mubahala in the Quran, what does it mean? It talks about the peaceful about Muslims. That when the Christian came to the Prophet to debate him. Now you think about it. If Islam is the religion of violence, and these people came all the way from Yemen to talk to the Prophet. About what? About debating with the Prophet about Islam. And when they came, the Prophet didn't say, okay, your assalamu alaikum is my soul, right? No, the came the Prophet was in the masjid praying. Performing the prayer, they walked into the masjid, they were playing drums, they were singing, they were dancing. And the Prophet didn't say to them, no. I'm going to fight you and kill you because you came into the mud. As a matter of fact, the narration said, when they walk in, after the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ told Imam Ali, find a best location for them in the masjid and make sure they are comfortable. After that, then the Prophet asked them, they came to the Prophet and said, Ya Muhammad, we want to go and pray. 
The prophet said, where are you going? They said, we want, we want to go out and pray and come back. The prophet said, who do you pray to? They said, God. The prophet said, this place is meant for God, so you are welcome to pray inside the masjid. Can you find any peace than this? Can you find any peace than that the prophet allowed them to pray inside the masjid and they, they performed their prayers and then after that they sat with the prophet. And they discussed with the prophet and later the prophet وسلم, became victorious and there was not even single bloodshot in that conversation with the prophet. How can Islam be a, law, a religion of violence? When the Prophet وسلم, in his life, he gave them the chance. Every, every non-Muslim in Islam at, of that time, they all were given the privilege to live along with the Prophet peacefully. The only time, the only time when the Prophet didn't allow some of them to live in Medina was when they started to attack the non-Muslims -Muslim, uh, in Medina. That is when the Prophet said, we have to defend ourselves. But other than that, the Prophet was not balanced. More than that, when the Prophet came to Mecca, the, arm, the, or the year the Prophet conquered Mecca, what happened? The Prophet came all the way from Medina to Mecca to perform Umrah. They didn't allow the Prophet. And the Prophet has to go back to Medina. And that is the year the Prophet wrote the treaty. And that treaty is amazing. What the Prophet وسلم, agreed with the non-Muslims. But there was no single fight with the Prophet with anybody else. It was peacefully. The Prophet signed. They signed. And the Prophet went down. Islam is not a religion of anything called bloodshed or anything called violence. Now, what is the cause of violence that we see today? Because really, when you look today, that when the world that we live today, you see, yes, if you look, most of the places that there is violence is the Muslim countries. What is the cause of this? Number one, the cause of the violence you see, one is ignorant. Ignorant is the first cause of all this violence that we see. Which is, a lot of people, they don't have the correct understanding of what Islam is. They think Islam is what they understood, while the true understanding of Islam is not what they thought they understood. Islam is something, and what they practice is something else. And the reason is why? Because they left the true Islam, which is Ahlul Bayt. The true Islam from Ahlul Bayt. So when you see people uh, acting the way they acted, one of the reasons is why? Is lack of knowledge. That is number one. Number two, one of the cause of violence that we see is self-interest. Self-interest, and one what you can put it? How about dunya? How about dunya is one of the causes. Anytime you see this kind of violence, anywhere in the world, the cause is the love of this world. You know, there is one beautiful saying of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Why is it? In Jumud al Ain, min Qaswat al Qalb. When you see a person, his eyes doesn't tear, doesn't cry for anything, I say the cause of this, the heart is tough. The heart has to be soft to allow the eye to tear. Does that one? Number two, there is a wa Qaswat al Qalb. And when you see the heart is so strong, doesn't cause the eye to tear, it's a waqaswat al qalb min nisyanillah. The cause of the heart to become that strong is because a person has forgotten Allah. When you forget Allah, then automatically what happens? The heart becomes tough. Then what caused the, somebody to forget Allah? Imam Ali said, wa nisyanullah min nisyan al maut. The cause of somebody to forget about Allah is because they forgot about death. You know why? Because anytime you remember about death, you remember about Allah. Because death is to meet with Allah. Now, then Imam Ali continues. He said, al maut. The cause of one to forget the death is nisyan al maut min tulil amal. The cause of somebody to forget about death is to have a long dream in life. 
I want A, B, C, D, all this list, then at one point, I forget that someday I'm going to die. And Imam Ali said, Watulul Amal. The long, the long wishes and desires, what is the cause? I said, Watulul Amal min hubbul dunya. It comes, the cause of it is the law of this world. And then he said, Wakubbul dunya ra'su kulli qatiya. And the law of this world is the head of every single sin. If a person loves this world, they're willing to do anything you can think of. And I'll give you one example about it. Shimur bin dul jawshan la'anatullah alayhi. After he killed Imam Hussein alayhi salam, and he came to Sham, and he said to, as he walked into the castle of Yazid, what did he say? He says, Imla arikabi faddatan aw dhahaba. He said, fill my jar with the gold and diamonds, or silver. Fa'inni, he said, Fa'inni qataltu khayran nas. I kill the best person who has the best parents. He said, he is confessing. He said, I killed Imam Hussein. And Imam Hussein has the best father and the mother in the world. Yazid was listening. Then Yazid said to him, if you have, if you knew that he has the best parent, why did he kill him? It's a good question. Now listen to his answer. He said, the reason why I killed him, oh boy, I don't know. I wanted money. I wanted money. That's the reason why I killed him. Not only Shimmer, you go to Omar bin Saad. Why did he kill Imam Hussein? Because he was promised a Jarjan and Rai. Hope of dunya is the cause. Now most of the violence that you see in this world of today, a lot of them have to do with what? With money. A lot of people, and I'm talking about this based on the research, a lot of people who you see, they commit suicide bomb, they go and they pay their families money so the family can have a better life, but in return, they have to go and commit your suicide bombs. In return to what? So that those people, those who pay the money, they, they, what do they get by paying that money? The reason why they pay the money? So one, they can get Islam to be under the question. So it has to do with what? What something has to do with the political reason. So what you see, we have to understand that what we see today is not just about money and that's it. No, there is a political reason behind it. And when you follow some of the news, there is a lot of group of people in the world today. They go into the poorest countries. And what do they do? They buy them. They give them so much money to go into other countries to go and commit this, time of the, this kind of things. That is one of the causes that we see, one of the reasons why we see this virus happen. Hubble dunya, that is number two. Number three, one of the causes of this virus that we see is not about the first or the second. One of them also is about some people, they want to see Islam as nothing but name. There are people, who want just Islam to be a name. Because Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world today. The people become Muslims, so they want to stop Islam from growing. How can they stop Islam from growing? The only way they can do is to give Islam a bad image. In other words, it's like advertisement to two companies. One company wants to make more money. What did they do? They have to put another company down so that their company can be what? Can be up. So in order to stop Islam from growing, they have to do something in order to keep Islam from growing so they can achieve their goals. That is also one of the reasons. So when you see this thing is happening, one, there is a lot of reason behind it. One of them is, there is those who are the enemies of Islam. They don't want Islam to grow. So one of the things they can do to stop Islam from growing is to act this way. That is another reason. And there are so many reasons as well. But now the question is, what do we need to do as a Muslims to stop this type of What is the remedy? What is the medicine? Because now we have talked about the disease. Now, what is the medicine that we have to provide 
so that we can give Islam the best image as Islam and Allah want us to do. Number one, as we mentioned, one of the causes is ignorant. Then we have to educate ourselves about the correct Islam. As other people who are trying to give the wrong image about Islam, we have to give the proper image about Islam. That when people, when they see this kind of Islam, which is the wrong message, and they look at the correct Islam message, then they can see the difference between the two. That is one of the medicine. And that puts every one of us under a responsibility. Which means, every one of us have to play as an ambassador of Islam in every place that you find yourself. Every one of us, at my work, in my school, in mall, on the street, everywhere I find myself, I have to act as an ambassador of Islam. The way I talk, the way I carry myself, the way I deal with people, it has to be based on the true Islam. That is number one. Number two, one of the ways that we can also change this image is we have to go back to Ahlul Bayt alayhi wassalam. Wallah, brothers and sisters, Ahlul Bayt is the answer. Anybody else cannot give us a proper understanding of Islam like the Prophet. That's why you see the Prophet emphasize before his death about two things Al Quran and Ahlul Bayt. But anybody else cannot give us the proper image of Islam. Allahu Akbar. And you see Imam Ali alayhi salam. He mentioned this during his time. When others were trying to portray Islam in the wrong way, he said, Nahnul Islam, Nahnul Quran Nathan. We are the Islam and we are the speaking Quran. Now, if you leave them and you go somewhere else, you will never find the true Islam as you supposed to have the correct Islam from the Prophet. That is number two. Number three, another way also is to understand that people, we have to let people to understand that nobody in this world represent Islam other than Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Yeah. Everybody that you see, it doesn't matter how great they are, how knowledgeable they are, nobody can represent Islam fully like the Holy Prophet and Ali Muhammad. So we cannot take action of somebody and compare it to be as Islam. Anything that I do or you do is my action. But when the Prophet acts, he acts as Islam. So people have to understand, whatever we see in any part of the world, that is not Islam. That is other people's action. The true Islam is not as what you see. The only one who represents Islam is Prophet and al Muhammad. That is number three. Number four, we have to understand also. That in every religion, there is always extremists. Every religion, you think about it. Every religion you can start, you can think of. There are always some group of people who will also do certain things in the name of religion for their own interest, and it has nothing to do with that religion. Whether it's the Muslims or Christians or Jews or any other religion that you can find, they always have a group of people who will act in the name of religion for their own interest. Example, in America, years ago, wasn't there were people who called themselves KKK? Who were acting under the name of Christianity. They thinking they're killing people, innocent people, but in the name of Islam. And they're thinking in their mind that they're doing God's job. They kill innocent people who are immigrants. They kill any, any person that they think, according to their mind, that is not a person who's supposed to live. And they're doing that and they call that this is the job of God. But do we call that religion the religion of terrorism because of that group? No. You never hear somebody call that group, uh, the entire religion, as a religion of terrorism because of that group. And the same thing, it applies in every religion. There is always a group of people who are extremists and they use their religion for their own reasoning or their own interest. But they have nothing to do with the religion. The same thing applies to the Muslim today. 
the people you see, they act in the name of Islam, they do this in the name of Islam, they are a group of people, they have nothing to do with Islam, they have their own agenda, their own interest that they want to achieve, and that is why they act in that way. But they are not really a people who are representing Islam. Now, among ourselves as a Muslim, how do we need to unite? The Prophet وسلم, he gave us the Holy Prophet gave us a beautiful way of how to start the peace among ourselves. The first step of achieving peace, it doesn't start from outside. Before I can give a peace, I have to have peace myself. I can't give something unless I have it. Now, how do I give a peace to somebody, to my neighbor, to my relative? I have to have a peace with myself first. Now, Islam said, before you can achieve peace, you have to ask, start where? With the internal peace first. And that's where the ayah will start. Before Allah talks about unity, brotherhood, Allah said, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu, taqullah. Taqwa Allah gives you the internal peace first. Imam Khomeini rahmatullah alayhi has a beautiful saying about peace. And he says, he says, when you look at the prophets, all the prophets that Allah sent, 124,000, if you put all of them together in one house, do you think they're going to fight each other? He said, no. Why is that? Because they achieve an internal peace with themselves first. And by doing so, none of them is about me or you. It's always about him. The peace to happen among the family, among the people, it has to start from internal first. That is where we have to start. Now, after we achieve the internal peace, then we go to the second level of peace. Because, wallah, Islam is a religion of peace, by the way. Look at the way we greet each other. Salam. How do we finish our prayer? The last word when you pray with Allah, when you pray, the last word you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. That's peace. The name of Allah, Allah's 99 names, one of the names is Assalam, peace. And even when we finish talking, وَآخِرُ دَعْوَانَا عَنِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ وَالسَّلَامُ عَلَى الْمُرْسَلِينَ It's always about peace. But the peace can start from the inside first. And then the second, it goes to outside. Outside, how do we have to achieve peace? The Prophet ﷺ said, Do you want me to teach you something? If you act upon it, you will achieve peace among yourself? He said, yes. He says, always spread the word peace among you, among you when you greet each other. Which is saying salam to each other. He said, when we see each other, we say, assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum. He said, that brings peace among ourselves. Because the word assalam is about what? A dua about peace. And you go to even Judaism, when they get together, when they say, when they greet each other, you know what they say? Oh, shalom, right? What does that shalom mean? A peace. Even in Judaism, when they greet each other, it's about salam. The more we circle this word, and you know what that means? That means Muslims, we need to refrain from hi and what's up. <laughs> and start with what? And start with assalamu alaikum when we see each other because it's going to help us to develop peace with each other. And when we develop that peace among ourselves, we can take it out to others as well. And the last thing I want to say, brothers and sisters, well, if you want to understand how peaceful Islam is, I urge everyone to read the one book of Imam Zain al-Abidin about the right of in, uh, in rights in Islam. How much? He has given the knowledge about the importance of every person's right, including animal, including the plant, how you live peacefully with not just yourself, not with the other human being, even with the nature and with everything around you.
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to learn and be peaceful with ourselves and practice peacefully with the others, insha'Allah. Ameen. Wa sallallahu wa ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. You mentioned these websites. Some of these people who are behind the websites cite a, a historical event. Uh, something happened with Bani Quraiza. Yes. What was that? Could you please shed some light on it? What Bani? Was Bani Quraiza. There's some, you know, men who were killed by Prophet of Bani Quraiza because they, they did something to the Muslims. What, what was that event? Because that's something that they cite a lot. When they make their argument against this. Country. Yes, what they said is that there was an, an incident that took place that they said that one day there was a sister who was a Muslim. She went to the market to buy something in the market. And she decided to sit somewhere to rest. So one of them, one of the Jews, they said, one of the non-believers, he came and he tied her hijab with some rope or some building. He tied up back of her hijab. So when she stood up, no. so when she stood up, her back exposed. And Muslim, and they were standing there laughing. That they were making fun of her. Like look at look at you, Muslim, look at how you are. Muslims were so angry about this. Because this was a disrespectful to a person, to a human being. Whether or regardless of your religion, any person doesn't deserve this kind of treatment. So some Muslims at that time, they took the right upon them to attack them and hurt and kill some of them because of that act, which the Prophet ﷺ was not approved of that. The Prophet ﷺ, when he heard about it, he didn't approve that killing because what happened is people have to understand, even at the time of the Prophet, there are some people who took the law in their hands to do certain things when the Prophet didn't approve it. And you can see that even in front of the Prophet, certain incident took place that people want to take that, the law in their hand. They all tell them, no, you can't do that. Let me do that myself. So that is what happened. So a lot of people, they use this, that Islam is against. Islam is the religion of violence because look at what they did. Because of one person's act, they went and attacked a lot of people of that time, especially the Jews. And some of them left Medina because of that incident. And they never even came back after that incident that I just mentioned. Yes. Um, most of the religions, even Jews, I mean, uh, right after the Prophet or even in the life of the Prophet, right. they deviated from the teachings of the Prophet, like Bani Israel, right. even for 40 days when Prophet Musa went away, they deviated. So the, the problem started from there. And, and the, the followers of that religion really didn't represent the religion and they deviated right. from it. So there's a long history of every religion and the representatives of that religion really don't follow the true exactly. religion. So, I mean, it's, it's not easy to uh, fix that history that we have. <laughs> I mean, you can do it at individual level you can try to bring the peace, but the problem is that history, even if it's written correctly, it's about the followers of the religion and they have deviated from the religion. So religion. The ideas. That's right, that's, for, that's absolutely right that there are a lot of um, misguidance that has took place. It's not just Prophet Musa salam. when you go up to some of the Prophet, there have been some division, some deviation from the true message. So when people took the wrong path, of course they're going to add some things from themselves and take the true message that the Prophet brought and act according to their own wishes and desires. And that is what happened with a lot of religion. Yes? It is mentioned time and again uh, that Islam is the religion of peace and there is no compulsion in Islam. Yes. Uh, but when you become a Muslim, there are some people who are born in a Muslim household. That's why they are Muslim. So sometimes they are not convinced that it's the religion for me or whatever. And they deviate from this religion. So it is also, I have heard, that the punishment for this crime of 
if you are a Muslim and you if you deviate from Islam, you become you know, a Jew or a Christian. Yes. Uh, the punishment is that uh, you have to give your life. Somebody has to take your life. Now, who are we to decide uh, that he's not a good person? When there's no compulsion, even the Prophet said that you should not kill somebody just for X, Y, Z reason. So if there is no compulsion, how a person can be killed without doing any crime or killing somebody? He's not doing anything, not harming anybody, but harming himself or whatever for whatever reason. But uh, is this a fair judgment that a person should be killed if he's deviates from Islam? Right. Um, the answer is that, see, first of all, Islam is like any other uh, religion. Islam is like any other uh, rulers. That when you go every country, they have their rules. You know, if you do A, you're going to get B. If you do B, you're going to get punished this way. Every, every country has their own laws. Now, Islam also is one of the religion with their laws. It has its own law that you can't do A, you cannot do B, you cannot do C. And if you do this, you're going to get punished this way. If you do this, you're going to get punished that. There's Islam and then another religion. Now, regarding of the killing when somebody leaves Islam, first of all, when, Islam, when we hear this, this type of ruling, we have to understand that there is a package with it. Islam doesn't just come and say, you leave your religion, you have to give your name. Ya Allah, Bismillah, Allah Akbar, somebody should cut them. No, no, that's not what it is. There are things we call bishartiha wa There are conditions around it. Number one, when somebody leaves the religion, Islam comes in and says, first, what is the reason why you live in your religion? Right? So the person has to have a reason. One, I'm not convinced. Then Islam has to prove somebody to convince him. Why I'm not convinced? He has to be given that chance to be convinced. That is one. Number two, no, somebody change religion. And maybe the reason is because they are mentally challenged. Because they have certain problems. Whatever it is, Islam has to look into all of that. So it's not like individual making decision. I'm going to make decision. He leaves Islam. I can come in and just take the law in my hand. No, no, no. It has to be first. It has to be based on Islamic government. They have to decide, not individual. Two, also those governments have to be by the ulama and maraja, who are the representative of imam. They have to, they are the one who have the right to make that decision. Not me, not anybody else. That is two. Number three, they have to say if the person have to be killed or not to be killed. They have to discuss the everything around that person. It's not just easy when somebody says, no, I am not a Muslim anymore. And then they say, no, you have to die because of that. No, there is more to it and it's not that easy. Because yes, Islam is more into saving life. The same Islam would not come and take that life that easy. So it's not that easy now. Yes. This issue of irtidal, it, it's really very important because we have had several discussions and, and back and forth on this thing. Right. The, 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 the notion that the, the punishment for irtidal is capital sort of a punishment, you know, killing a person, I, I, I don't understand as to where this thing has come from because Islam doesn't say that. Yes. It, like you said, it's an it's a issue of jurisprudence. And, and for example, uh, America kills people, that doesn't mean that you know, we, we generalize it you know, and, and start asking why America kills people. There are rules and, and there are you know, conditions based on which people are put to death. So why is it that sometimes we sort of you know, bring things without the context? And, and, and again, I'm not saying you know, yes. based on what the, the current question was, it has been discussed a lot in our community and we have you know, several people who are, you know, so can, can you give us some more information on, on this issue? Because it seems to be a very troubling issue for some of us. I really believe, I think we can set up one session for that. <laughs> like the punishment and the crime in Islam. How does it work? The system of crime and punishment in Islam. Because really, Islam is not about punishing. Islam is a religion of mercy. I'll give you one example. A woman came to the Prophet Imam Ali alayhi salam during his time and it's called Al Ghamidiyah who committed sin and his sin is one of the capital punishment. Imam Ali alayhi salam told her 
He said, go and ask Allah to forgive you at the middle of night and don't come back. Allahu Akbar. Imam Ali alayhi salam, he was to tell her that the message of Islam is not to punish you, to cut your hair, to cut your hand when you steal. No, the message is Allah has put those laws to let you and I not to cross the line. But if a person commit the law and cross the law and they commit the sin, it's not up to me or you to judge. Allah SWT has given the aspect in that field. The same thing here when somebody commits crime. There are people who are known as experts in the crime to go and discuss the whole issue and come up with the result. If the person had did really commit the crime or didn't commit the crime. If he commit the crime, then he go put the over the hand it over to the judge to make the decision what the person deserves. The same thing Islam has. That Islam doesn't say that oh when a person commit crime A, that's it. He has to die or she has to die. There are more to it. More to it than we think. Really. When you go to the fifth, is there is more details for every punishment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we said in the Quran, Ma yaf Allah bi adabikum. Allah said, I don't want to punish you. <coughs> in Amant, in Shakatum Amantum. I said, if you do believe and you're grateful to Allah. So the purpose is not the punishment. This is something that Allah has put just to prevent people from doing the crime. Does any, any kid have any questions? Kids? Kids. It's a tough any subject right now. <laughs> I, I have a question. Yes, please. Um, what is the the tafasir of um, Sunnah brother about the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Because um, from our perspective, as you described, the rope of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or Bainul Bayad. Yes. So how do you reconcile? I mean, the, the, the peace of Islam with the non-Muslims is, is one aspect of it. The biggest challenge right now is, is the peace within ourselves, right. especially with the with the you know with the brothers from other sect. Um, so in the definition or the tafasir of rope of Allah, the Sunnis would have you say that the Sahaba are all sincere. And, and how do you how do you, how do you reconcile that? And how do you convince or how do you even absorb something like that when a Sahaba are part of that rope where now the, you know where some of them have done the most heinous crimes. Right. You know, knocking the door I mean things like that, right? So where is where is this disconnect and how do we fix that? Or or is it can it be even fixed or Yes, in terms of the, the tafsirs, the majority of them, like when you would tafsir Fakhr Razi or Tafsir al Kashaf, which are one of the great Sunni scholars of tafsirs, uh, one of the things that they mainly mention that is considered the rope of Allah, they say is either Quran one, two, or the Prophet, three, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is one of the main thing that they mention. Yes, they don't include the Ahlul Bayt, Ali Musalam, as we mentioned. But these three are the main thing that they said that is considered the rope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But in terms of the companions, I haven't seen any tafsir say that the rope of Allah is the companions. I haven't seen one. Maybe there might be some, but I haven't seen. Most of what I say is either they say Allah or the Prophet or the companion of God. Or the, the, the Allah or the Prophet or the Quran. These three are considered the, the rope of Allah that we all should gather. And they made the references too. They say because Allah says in uh, when the Muslims have argue about something, they have to go back to whom? To the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the rope that keeps it together. So that is what the Quran says. But in terms of the companions, yes, we all as a Muslims, we in combine respect the companions who have Follow the Prophet and obey the Prophet and did not change after the Prophet. One of them, Salman al Farisi. No Muslim can say today, Salman al Farisi is a bad person. It's a companion and every Muslim respects him. One. Two. Another one, Bilal al Habashi. Is there any Muslim say, I don't like Bilal al Habashi, Muadan of the Prophet? No. Number three, Abu Dhar al Ghafari. These are all companions. And we respect them and we honor them. But there are some companions who have changed after the Prophet. And they did some things that the Prophet didn't approve of it, even the Quran didn't approve of it. 
and all we have to do is to talk about those incidents and also be aware about those incidents and stay away from them. And I think this is something that every intellectual person will agree that, yes, we have to talk about it, and whatever is the mistake, we have to point out this is a mistake and it shouldn't have happened. Okay. Yes. Oh, I just like to verify. No, yes. then the last of it, then the last of it. Not the last of it. Anyone? It's a boss. <laughs> um, it's just I just like to verify a historical fact. Since you mentioned uh, Shemur, uh, it, it, it seems in history when we look at you know these personalities, they appear suddenly in, in you know Karbala and then disappear. And when they appear, they are very bad people. Where were they before that? It seems you know somebody told me, and I did not know about it, that he actually fought alongside Amir Mohammed in the Philippines. So he was a, a sort of a Shia Ali, you know, if, 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 if you if you like to use that term. So, uh, isn't that something that we should also, you know, take lesson from that there were people who were, you know... Um, Good, and then turn yeah. three back, yes. Actually, there are a lot of them. And if you remember when I was talking in the first ayah, I said, وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ That Allah is emphasizing that we should not die unless we are true Muslims. A lot of the people, they started as good people. To begin with, they were practicing, they were praying, they were fighting, they were doing everything perfect. But then suddenly, Shaitan misguided them. And one example itself is Shaitan himself. Shaitan started perfect. He was praying, performing the Sajda Ruku, but at the end, he took the wrong path. So, yes, when you go to the history, a lot of people who were in Karbala, some of them, they were good to begin with. They were with Imam Ali alayhi salam. Even Khawarij as we speak, Khawarij, those who stood against Imam Ali, they were companions of Imam Ali. Talha and Zubair, they were followers of Imam Ali. They were good with him to begin with, but then later on, one is or another, they turned. So a lot of those companions, yes, in history, they fought with Imam Ali. They did things with Imam Ali, but then later on, unfortunately, they took the wrong path because of the help of dunya and because of the money and power and position. Any, yes, yes. Anyone has yes. last question? One question. Okay, go ahead. I'm going to ask you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm going to ask you. Okay. Among ulema's of different sects where they try to, you know, bring people together or talk about reconciliation or conversation. Yes. Absolutely. There is a big, last year we had um, the Shia scholars in North America in the leadership of the Office of Sayyid Sistani. Sayyid Kashmiri, and I was one of them, we had a joint program with ISNA, who are the biggest, one of the biggest organization of Ali Sunnah in America. That they came, in our program, they spoke, in our Lamas conference, and we went to their conference too, and we spoke, and they gave us a chance, we were on the stage, and we also formed like a committee but a two school of thought that we're going to work together hand in hand and not only hand in hand, we want to even go further that we go to the each other center and work together as a team so that we at least the world can see that we can work together. So yes, that started last year between the two of us. Uh, two, the two of us. Yes. Okay, sisters? Okay. 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 Uh, during that event, uh, when they were in Makkah and Medina, they used to work for Christians and Jews and so on. Yeah. So that place Christians and Jews lived there. Now they are not allowed to live in Medina and Mecca. When did that start? What time? What date frame? And approximately, what happened when this, this stopped? No, the question is, the Jews and Christians, they can come to Makkah and Medina. If they want to come, they are welcome to come. They can stay there, that's fine if they want. Well, the one that cannot go there is mushrik. And mushrik is anybody who associates Allah with something. Because it's considered, according to the Shia as Islam, it's najis. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wala yaqrabu al-masjid al-haram. And when you look at the eyes, talking about the mushrik. But in terms of the going in there, they can. So, this is only the Shia school of thought. Allows them, but also in the Saudi system, 
No, in terms of the point that they can go there, what they can't do is go into the haram. Mm. But they're not okay, they're not even allowed to enter the city. No, they are not. I think that is the Saudi government. Yeah, it's the government problem. It's the Saudi problem. Yeah, it's the Saudi problem. They just happen to have power there. And only mushrik can know. Yes, if a person is a mushrik, then they can. Because the Quran says, لا يقرب المسجد الحرام. They shouldn't go any closer to the city, which is either Mecca or Medina. But in terms of the Halil Kitab, they're Tahir. They can come to the city of Mecca or Medina. Because at the time of the Prophet, they were there. If the Prophet didn't tell them they, can't, they cannot live there, then they shouldn't have left, I mean at the time of the Prophet. But they were there in Mecca and Medina with the Prophet, and the Prophet didn't tell them to leave until the incident that took place, and that, that led them to leave the Mecca and Medina. Allah. 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 Allah.